Okay, we're good to go. Um, so, welcome to the Monday night select board meeting for Monday, June 17th. It's a beautiful day outside and uh, we're stuck in here doing the people's business. So, uh, with that, I'll ask for somebody to approve the agenda if there's no add-ons or changes. <coughs> Looks like there might be something. Yeah, I have one addition um, to, <coughs> excuse me, consider uh, grants and aid uh, from BTRANS, the Regional Planning Commission, with regard to our Municipal Road General Permit. Where would so you like we to slide that in there? Put it in the select board item somewhere. Okay. And just as a heads up, Steve is supposed to be here at 740. I just got an email from him. He's just leaving Burlington and hopes he'll be here in time. So if we if we have to, we'll skip to the select board items first. I'll make a motion to approve the agenda with those changes. I'll second. No further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Uh, second on the items, consent agenda items, minutes of the June 3rd meeting, and a liquor license and outside consumption permit for the new McGillicuddy's pub. I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda items. Second. Uh, no further questions. All those wish to approve, say aye. 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 Public, anybody from the public here wish to speak at this point? Seeing none, we'll jump to the interview for the Board of Listeners. Mary, take aye. it, that's you. You're welcome to come up to the chair or stand to the mic, whichever you prefer. So, uh, you want to be an add-on for the listers, huh? I do. Give us a little bit of a background and maybe reasonings why you're excited to do so. I will do answer that question, maybe not the second part, but certainly the first part. Uh, I um, served the town of Waterloo in the 90s as town health officer and found that to be a really fulfilling and interesting experience. And since then, I haven't been involved in the town in providing any type of community service. And listening to my brother, um, Bill Woodruff, who has been a lister, and previous to that, um, David Keefe, and then Alec Tuscany, and uh, Phil Baker. Um, I've learned about what the listers do, and seen what they've been called upon. Um, I myself have been before the Board of Listers, and understand what an important role that is, and how they are part of the face of the town. And typically in that type of situation, the person coming before them is not in a good place. And so the listers have to be you know, sensitive and impartial and listen to people. And I think that I'm very good at that. Um, I've officiated high school and college sports for years and have been in very tense situations with people that are upset and wanting things to go their way. And, not that being a lister is exactly the same thing, but I think that you have to bring a perspective and common sense and respect to the people that you serve. In addition, I think, you know, looking at how property values impact every resident in some way, shape, or form, I do think it's an important component of the town's work and would be pleased to serve. Well, there's no doubt that uh, being a lister is kind of a, one of those invisible cogs in, in the wheel of works that, um, you know, makes the municipality uh, function. Um, I'm sure at times uh, being a lister can be difficult, listening to somebody grieve their taxes or, you know, I, I don't know if I was a lister years ago when I was a young guy there in Duxbury, it was so long ago, I kind of forgot what it was uh, really all about, you know, appraising homes and evaluating uh, 
everybody's uh, parcels to try to not be too impactful on everybody's pocketbooks, but yet have to generate the revenue source that uh, keeps us going here. So. Well, and I think it's so transparent now with the parcel map that's online. You know, people have a lot of information at their fingertips, and so it's important to really be impartial and fair and try to strike, you know, that place because of that transparency. People can compare um, property values, and I think that that's, I think that's healthy. And I, I think that really probably helps the role of Lister and Assessor uh, Dan Sweet in doing their jobs. Any other board members like to ask any questions? I think it's great that you'd like to step up. <laughs> yeah, it's important that <clears throat> more people try to help out with the municipality. It's, uh, I think it's meaningful and, and gives you a sense of uh, accomplishment and pride to be a part of the town and, and, uh, and help out because as time goes on, it seems like less and less volunteerism is uh, available to us. Um, so we would certainly welcome anybody that wants to step up to the plate. How many listers are there? Three. Three. Currently. Currently there are two. Currently are there. <clears throat> Bill Woodruff has resigned because he's moved out of town. So is there a, uh, a term period? To town meeting. And then Bill's term would have been up, so then the mayor will have to hopefully take out a petition. So that would be uh, March what, of 2020. March uh, 3rd. So, so there'll be like somebody elected on March 3rd, so she'll have to serve yeah. through March 3rd. Yeah. So if somebody would uh, <coughs> make a motion to bring Mary on board uh, from now till March 3rd, 2020. We can let her begin her duties. I'll make that motion, so moved. Is there a second? Second. second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any further discussion? All right, seeing none, <coughs> all those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank Welcome. you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Welcome, welcome yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Yeah. That assistant health job is still open. <laughs> <laughs> you, <laughs> um, maybe in a few years. <laughs> I'll see how Lister goes. Yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, thanks for coming in tonight, yeah. Mary. Yeah, you're welcome. I thought the same thing on a nice night. I thought, oh, maybe I'll skip this. But, uh, <laughs> um, and Carla, I'll let Dan know about okay. the 27th. Yeah. Okay. Good night. It was quick yeah, anyway. Thanks. Sign an oath or something. Oh, and you'll, you'll have to stop in at some point and sign an oath before that. Okay. Yeah. I'll do. I'll do that. Yeah. yeah. And fill out some employment paperwork. Is a big, big paycheck that goes with this job. So. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks again. <laughs> Okay, while well, Nat's getting some new batteries, we can kind of move on to our item, next item on the list, which is an interview for the animal control officer, which is shocking that somebody actually is here to uh, apply for that position. <laughs> Are you the young lady that's doing so? Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, you can either stand at the mic or come up to sit in a chair. <coughs> your name there first. I'm Andy Andrea McMahon. Um, I actually live in Duxbury up on Camel's Hump, moved up there in 1980. Um, I own and run Rip and Co Kennels, which is a boarding and grooming kennel. I've uh, been involved in dogs and animals uh, all my life. Um, as a teenager, started working for vets, went to school to get my animal science degree. Uh, continued as a vet tech for many years, um, and then when we moved up here, it just kind of fell into, would you take care of my dogs? We raised uh, Siberian Huskies for about 40 years, showing them all over the country. Um, we darn successful, enjoyed it immensely. 
Um, and given that I'm, you know, responsible dog ownership is um, dear to my heart. Um, I've been the past president, past show chair for the Green Mountain Dog Club. That is one of our uh, goals of helping people become responsible dog owners. Um, and then a couple of years ago, Zeb asked if I would help out when he was getting busy or when he was in the woods, um, times like that. And I said, yeah, sure, why not? Um, found out there was a little bit, a lot happened when Zeb was gone in the woods. Um, I actually did, you know, one call for Waterbury at one point uh, and had to bring a dog up to uh, Lamoille Kennels. But um, I just figured this is, it, it's sort of a natural, you know, since Zeb stepped down, just seemed like, yeah, I can probably do this. Um, I definitely, you know, I'm all set with Duxbury, I'm their animal control officer. Um, and I think, given what I know from working with Zeb, I can probably handle Waterbury also. So, you know, and it's not, like Carla said, it's not horses and sheep and cattle and all that kind of stuff. So it's, you know, should be something I should be able to handle pretty well. So, Andrea, how long have you been doing Duxbury's uh, animal control? For, for, well, as, as Zeb's assistant, a couple of years. But no, I was just like um, two select board meetings ago. Last month, I became the official. So if you've dealt with dogs all your life, perhaps uh, dealing with, uh, home, or with owners that uh, don't necessarily want to be responsible pet owners. Right. If, yep, have you it's, run across it's, any difficulties with that type of thing? And, I'm, I'm spent much of my life talking to people about that and, and you know, I, it, I don't feel that you can go into somebody's face and say, you're doing this wrong. Um, I don't like the whole, we're going to take your dog away. Um, the thing, you need to work with people. How can we make this situation better? Um, and this is, you know, this is something, as a person, we, you know, we raised Siberian Husky, we placed uh, puppies in homes, and one of, them, one of my big things is always following up. I always know where all my puppies were and went. Um, and in doing so, I also did rescue, Siberian Husky Rescue for the National Club. Um, so I got a lot of calls. Um, people wanted to get rid of their dogs, or complaints from neighbors, the dog killed the chickens. Um, so it's, it's something I've been doing kind of all my life, is mediating. Um, education just goes a whole lot further than threats. And that's more my goal, is, is let's try to get people educated. Um, I want to see everybody up to date on vaccinations. I, you know, I, I'm not going to chase anybody down that's not licensed um, unless somebody in the town you get a complaint or something like that but i don't feel that that's something you can do is just try to scrounge around is your dog licensed um but you know if a complaint comes in then absolutely you have to follow up that the dog is vaccinated that it is licensed and we you know i've already had to do that three times in duxbury um, so, you know, and, and when, I, when Zeb called and asked me to do this, one of the things I asked him, because, you know, he's a big, strong, young guy. I'm not. And I, you know, I said, I don't want to get in this situation, and I have been. I've worked with the Vermont State Police um, in circumstances where dogs had to be removed. Um, I don't want to be the one knocking on some big, burly guy's door and saying, um, you're not doing this right. Um, Zeb did tell me that if there's ever a problem, uh, the state police are involved in anything like that. So I'm fine with that, and I'm fine with talking um, to owners. And a lot of times they just don't understand. They don't understand that their dog is bothering the neighbor, that the dog comes over and poops on his lawn, or that it's chasing his sheep, or just even threatening the family. So sometimes it's just a matter of, opening somebody's eyes to look at the other side of the story. You know, not everybody loves your dog. Uh, you, just, you just took the words out of my mm -hmm. mouth. I was just going to say that uh, 
people have a hard time understanding that uh, they may love a dog mm -hmm. or love dogs, yep. but other people do not. Right. Um, I will uh, admit freely that I grew up with in a household that had dogs, but after I left home, uh, with the way my life is structured and the family and the business career and everything, uh, it just really found that I had no use for dog. Uh, and as time went on, it became more clear to me that not only did I not want a dog, but I didn't want anybody else's dog either. Yeah. And uh, I'm not afraid to make that point to people. Um, yep. They're welcome to have their dog as long as they, they uh, keep it their dog. Yeah, I agree. Some, so to some people, that's very difficult to get through to them. It know? is. It's a little bit hard for them. Yeah. And you, one would think that I would welcome, you know, but we are very, like, no, I don't want your loose dog at my house. And that's, you know, um, I totally get it. I don't want your loose dog, if I'm out walking, coming up to me. Um, I, I definitely see both sides of it. I mean, I love dogs, but I love dogs that behave properly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And the rest of the board have any questions, comments? I think you're the most qualified candidate <laughs> I've ever seen for this wow. position. So Chris, it's a point we'll be in So Andrea, you won't mind uh, coming down off the hill uh, Nope. Nope, believe it or not. You know, and we do have vans. We have two vans that are fully, um, there. there's permanent crates in the vans. So we, you know, we transport dogs. We come down um, to the Waterbury Park and Ride every day, 7.30 in the morning and 4 in the afternoon to pick up and deliver so they don't have to go up the Camel's Hump Road, <laughs> which is not in very good shape. So, no, you know, it's it's not, we're up and down. We've got all-wheel drive, studded snow tires. We're in and out every day. So, Bill, uh, we haven't heard much in the way of you know, out-of-control dogs. Uh, is this still pretty quiet, or are things? Yeah, I haven't really heard much at all. Um, <clears throat> you know, we've kind of transitioned from having a very um, kind of uh, I don't want to say aggressive, but a dog officer, an animal control officer who was out, you know, trying to enforce the ordinance on a day in and day out basis to a much more... Before you know, with, Zeb. Yeah. With Zeb, it yeah. was much more hands off. It was, if there's a call, a complaint, I'll come and see it. We haven't had too many, uh, I, we haven't had any complaints of late. I was just at the, uh, walking over to the swimming pool area today to check on some things there and I noticed the sign that said you know the ordinance and that no dogs on the playing fields and stuff and I do notice that happens a little bit more regularly now than it used to but nobody's complaining about it so yeah I haven't read Waterbury Waterbury's ordinances actually and I should do we that. Can get Is that it to you. Yeah, it's I would like to. Website too. I, I figured it probably yeah. was. It's probably pretty similar to Duxbury and I'm assuming yeah. there is a leash law. Yeah. Um, there is. Yeah. And you know the <clears throat> dogs are welcome in parks but we ask that they're always leashed in a park yeah. and that owners try to keep them off of playing fields. So sure. you know the Nobody People wants to slide in on <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, if you pay attention to that. But. Yeah. Okay. Do you know, is there, are there any, you know, this is one thing I've never noticed. Are there any um, poop stations? Yeah. With, with baggies? Yes. Perfect. I'll, so, I'll figure out where all those are, too. Yeah, there, <clears throat> there should be at least one in the parks. Mm -hmm. There's a couple along Main Street. Um, Rusty Parker Park has them. So, yeah, they're around. Great. And, and who's in charge of? The highway department. And they do that on a regular? Yeah. Excellent. Have you been to the dog park as well? No. I'm not a fan of dog parks. Okay. Do you know where it is, though? Yes, I do. Yeah. You won't find my dogs there, though. So, Ann, you're a fre fairly frequenter or any more of the dog park? Um, has that thing kind of quieted down? I sort of supervise um, 
the kids that have sort of taken over running the park. Uh, I mean, is it still well used, or is okay. it kind of? Oh yeah, I was down there um, yesterday afternoon, and there was a couple there from Montpelier. They come here regularly because they think it's a great place. For them. <laughs> they don't have any place uh, in Montpelier, and I've seen people previously from Montpelier and Moortown. Uh, There's plenty of locals there too. It's still yeah. it's still used. They're, they're I doing it. Good job of maintaining it. It's it looks good. It's maintained. It's well kept. Um, you know, so we haven't had any complaints about that either. And I think when it first got off the ground there, there was uh, maybe some issues with uh, unruly dogs at one point or whatever. But probably yeah. could have worked and worked the kinks out of that since. And the the utility district owns the dog park, and they. Uh, entered into an MOU with, what's the name of the group? Watery Unleashed. Uh, Watery Unleashed. And Watery Unleashed has two people that have been appointed by the utility district to oversee and, and to uh, enforce the rules and intervene in any kind of dispute. So there's somebody down there fairly regularly checking things over, and we haven't had any concerns about it. Okay. Well, if there's no objections, <coughs> we have a motion to uh, approve Andrea Ripley. McMahon. McMahon. Boy, now that. I'm sorry. <laughs> that used uh, to be I wasn't Ripley. sure. Yep. <laughs> Andrea McMahon to the uh, animal control officer's position from now till April 30th of 2020. I'll make a motion as described. I'll second. All right. No further discussion. I'll say thank you. <laughs> you seem very well. You seem very well qualified, and I think you have a nice way about you. So I think this will go really smoothly. So thank you. Well, thank you. All right then. All those in favor, say aye, please. Aye. 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 So Andrew, the appointment is till April thirtieth, because that's what all of our appointed <clears throat> positions are. So. Gotcha. During April after town meeting, we do reappointments. All right, so it isn't a town meeting. It's a, it's appointed by the select board. Right. Afterwards. Okay. That's why it's April 30th. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. So we wish you luck, Andrea. All righty. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'll take a look at the ordinances. And then um, who do I expect to hear? Will it go through the town if usually? Or... You'll get my phone number listed. Yeah, we'll, we'll post your <laughs> phone number if that's okay. Yep, 244-8556. Can we post your email as well? Yep, it's Rip and Co. R-I-P-A-N-C-O at AOL dot com. We'll get that on our website. Great. And, the and sometimes page. people will reach out to you directly. <laughs> Other times they're call <laughs> Carla. Sure. She'll get in touch with you. Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Also, your number will be put up at the dog park. Okay. All right. Good to know. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Welcome All set. aboard. Thank, Thank you. you. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Get out of here soon. My husband's on the Duxbury yeah. yeah. Select Board. We're having a meeting tonight, too. So <laughs> it's Select Board night. Yeah. Thanks very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, you're oh no, I'm next. We're, uh, so I, I have copies, but I did email you um, the financial management questionnaire that's right. required to be completed by the town treasurer each year by June 30th, and basically just ensuring that we have checks and balances and division of duties between the treasurer, the bookkeeper, the municipal manager. So, you and me. <coughs> Making sure I'm not embezzling, writing checks to myself. All right. Heavens knows we know that there's enough of that going on in this country. Um, and it's just required to be signed. I uh, probably approved and signed by the chair. Is there a motion needed? Yeah. Probably should. Okay. I would make a motion to uh, approve the financial, the signing of the financial management questionnaire. I'll second that. 
Was there any questions about it? No, the further discussion? All those approved, say aye. 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 Thank you. Okay, authorization. Authorized contract with 106 Associates for survey of proposed Ferrars additional historic district. Right. We're going to have to put that on hold for a minute until Steve okay. gets here. Steve, oh, because of Steve, yeah. Yeah. Sorry about that. Oh. Okay, you want to jump to one of the select board items then? Sure. We could do the vendor ordinance. Okay. So that's already been approved. You just, I just need a signature for it because it became effective on uh, Saturday. Okay. All right. Okay. Do you want to jump on to the grants and aids application or whatever it is? Sure. Go ahead and sign that yep. for us. This is kind of an annual uh, event that we need to consider. Um, the state has determined that Waterbury has uh, 25 to 30 miles of our town highways that are hydrologically connected to uh, surface waters, so streams, brooks, rivers, and the like. And um, as such, um, these are important waterways that the state is attempting to clean up in both the Champlain Basin and the Connecticut River Basin, uh, and I imagine even in the Magog Basin for those few towns that uh, drain that way. Anyway, um, the state has made money available uh, to municipalities through the regional planning commissions and it's all based on these number of miles of road. So in our case, uh, we're entitled to a grant of uh, $12,700. Uh, Worcester, which only has 10 to 15 miles of connected roadway, they get $5,700. Barry City and Town, they have 40 to 45 miles of highway that are connected hydrologically. Hydrologically, they get 19,600 and so on. Northfield looks like they're the big winner, $21,900 for 45 to 50 miles. Um, with this money, we are expected to do projects that we do anyway every year. We, there's a, um, a general permit now that municipalities have to get from the state of Vermont in order to, um, to uh, operate our highways, and this is one of the issues that we have to deal with. So we're expected, we're appropriate to put in stone line ditches or grass line ditches. Uh, culvert replacement projects are uh, permissible uh, uses for this money, as are outfalls from um, uh, storm drains, catch basins. So we've already got money in our budget to do culverts and ditches and storm drains and the like. Um, and we can use this money to supplement or support our own uh, budget. So we don't have to put more money in the budget, which I'll, I'll let them decide why or why not. 
Um, there's a 20% match, <coughs> which can be done in cash or in kind. Um, we will make the match either way. We have, we've got much more than this money in our uh, budget, and we will spend more staff time on it. So I would ask that uh, the board approve uh, the um, letter of intent to participate in the Municipal Roads Grant Aid Program and authorize me to sign the application on behalf of the town, which has to be submitted by July 3rd. Would somebody like to make that motion? I'll make that motion to approve the um, just letter what you, of intent. Just what you said. <laughs> so that letter of intent for the town roads reimbursement program. There is a second. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Who told me that? I did. Uh, um, so, quick question. This spring, when we were making our presentation at the State House for additional funds for our roads, there was complaints from some of the other officials from other towns that, uh, in fact, I may have said it, or you may have said it there, that the towns are going to be burdened with this uh, additional cost uh, to try to help fix up Lake Champlain. Uh, it, this seems that this, this uh, grant process seems to be um, maybe a partial fix from the state level to help out with that, but yet I think if the towns had just received it through state aid to highway, uh, is this their way of maybe <laughs> stipulating that that money goes specifically yeah. towards that? Is that what this is yeah. about? Yeah, and that's why I said before that it's kind of an odd situation where they don't necessarily re require you to do more than you were doing otherwise. So there may be some towns out there that didn't or have not uh, included in their budgets stone lining ditches or grass lining ditches, you know, and because of this and, and the, general, uh, the general permit that the state has to issue now that has to be approved, uh, they're required now to do that, and the state's giving them money for it. In our case, we've been doing this kind of thing for a long time. They're not telling us you've got to spend more money. They're just providing this money to us. So um, it is their way of kind of targeting this as an issue, and there's probably a few mun municipalities where they're hitting the target and getting something more done. Most cities and towns that I know of are are doing this kind of stuff already. Well, it's funny, over the weekend, my son-in-law, who's uh, an engineer for the state, was telling me that uh, there was a conversation about this particular issue, cleaning up Lake Champlain, and the fact that the towns were going to be required to deal with, you know, ditchways and stormwater and whatnot. Uh, and the comment was made that the real problem is the uh, sewage runoff when these uh, facilities are flooded. The, the amount of impact from those way outweighs what's coming from the roads, apparently. And the comment was also made that this is an easy way of shutting people up uh, by by. You know, the people that are complaining apparently about cleaning up Lake Champlain, uh, this is a more visible, I guess, uh, solution than, yeah. and, and a cheaper solution than the cost of doing what's necessary for these um, well, you know, the, water management it, facilities. It's, it's, the issue in those facilities is not really wastewater from sewage systems. Back in the middle part of the 20th century, the, the normal practice in municipalities was to basically combine uh, stormwater overflows and put it into the wastewater systems. And you know that worked perfectly well. And when those overflows happen and the, the runoff from streets goes into the sewage treatment facility, and if it gets treated, 
it's it's better water being discharged into the river than it would be if it just went down the storm drain and out of pipe into the street, I mean, into the river. The problem is with development that has occurred over time, you have much more impervious surfaces. And now when you have these, you know, two inch rain events in an hour and a half on city streets, they all flow in. They flow to the wastewater treatment plant or pump stations, and there's too much volume, and they can't process it, and it ends up being discharged along with untreated sewage directly into the river because there's a bypass there. So it's hard to blame those cities for this. This is not meant to cure that problem. The problems that this will address need to be addressed. It's issues that we're dealing with on Ring Road. Um, you know, places where there's been a higher intensity development than the infrastructure there was designed to handle. Um, this will help us on uh, places like the dip, uh, where we're trying to deal with, with washouts. Um, so it's important that this kind of stuff be done. My comment was that, you know, it's helping us in that we're we're getting a little help to pay for things that we were otherwise doing. We're not necessarily doing more than we would have otherwise, and except for the camera, I, you know, I don't want to go into that too much, so people don't get a bright idea to make us, you know, actually spend the money and, and a higher level of money. Well, we have the the combined sewer outflows is a is a much bigger issue. I know the public works director, former mayor of Rutland, Jeff Wenberg, has indicated, you know, it's millions and millions of dollars just for the city of Rutland alone. And uh, to expect they're going to be able to do that on their own without assistance, it's just not yeah, going to happen. Yeah, I think that was kind of what the, the discussion that I was talking about was about, that the, yeah. the millions that it would take to actually address the real impact. Yeah. And, and the unfortunate part of it, and I'm not minimizing the work that we're doing, we put these stone line ditches in which means every so many years you actually have to go and take the stone out and then dig out the sediment that the stones trap and then you gotta put the stone back in. So it's a little bit more labor intensive, a little bit more work for us, but it does what it's intended to do. The unfortunate part is, if, you know, you drive down Route 2 right now and you look at what's coming out of the Little River based on that landslide that happened a couple weeks ago up in in uh, Cotton Brook area, uh, you know, the, the amount of uh, sediment that's going down the river now dwarfs anything that, you know, right. every municipality in central Vermont could get out of the water by doing these projects. Right. Yeah, yeah. Having I think I'm on now. Uh, having worked in um, financing sewer systems, you know, throughout the, the state. The problem is, if you want to finance sewer systems that will take care of all the load, get very deep pockets. They're, they're designed to pick up a certain percent of the load, and when you do have events, you just, they, there will be excess load that winds up going into the rivers. Not, you know, not that I think but that's a good thing, but I don't think we could afford to, you know, get every public sewer system to mitigate, you know, those problems. It's just, it's just an economic factor. And when the load supersedes our ability to treat and we discharge, we get fined, so. Right. Well, it's funny because this winter when I was coming through Montpelier at one point there, I looked at the snow banks along the... Uh, Edge of the Winooski there from whatever route it is there, and it's the snow banks were black, almost like they were coated in black tar. And I'm thinking to myself, that crap is going into the river at some point, you know, when it thaws and runs yeah. off. And I just, it, it was a travesty to see that kind of stuff. And it's been going on for years, you know. Um, so none of our new reconstruction project here is tied in, the, none of the storm drains are tied into our facility, right? The treatment no, facility. no, we don't have combined sewers right, yeah, here. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all, uh, it's all going you know, on. but we have, the Main Street project is 
definitely uh, doing an upgrade to the stormwater treatment here off of the village streets. Yeah. Um, you know, um, down by uh, behind uh, Napa, you know, near where Doc Dumas, I still remember it as Doc Dumas' house is, you know, there is a discharge there that basically goes directly to the river. But the storm drainage that we put in that crosses the uh, Stanley Hall parking lot behind uh, Rick Darby's office, uh, the storm drainage that goes down Elm Street, uh, that is going overland even further than it used to, out through the cornfield, through the you know grassy swales, which will catch the sediment. Um, except, of course, when the you know if the river floods, that you know you're not going to trap any too much sediment that way. But there's a lot higher degree of uh, treatment through those uh, grass swales than we had. And then, of course, once they get down to this end, there'll be a sand filter that's built right in our front lawn of this building, and that will discharge uh, to Thatcher Brook, which of course runs right into the Winooski. And you know we'll have to maintain that sand filter. We'll have to clean it out every so often. I don't know what the manual is yet on it. but So we have done a lot to improve the stormwater quality here in, in the village area. Well, that's a good thing. Okay, got a little sidetrack there. Motion's been made and seconded, and um, if there's a voice of approval, everyone could say aye. 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 Okay, Steve's here. Steve's so. here. Yep. Hand it back. Yep. <clears throat> okay, very good. So uh, the item, as you can see, is uh, doing an historic structure, site and structure survey for Ferrars edition. Uh, we brought this to you during the budget time, and um, I'm just going to pass around the proposal that uh, our committee selected. Uh, I've just got the one copy. Uh, just to give a quick recap, uh, this is the area that is to the west and the north of the roundabout, basically. Uh, it's the area of Butler Street, Wallace Street, uh, so on, uh, out to the limits of the, the former village of Waterbury. Uh, <clears throat> it's about 65 houses and commercial structures, and uh, we budgeted $12,000 to do a survey. This is a project that our historical society is very interested in. The uh, EFED commissioners are very interested in. So uh, we put out a request for proposal back in the end of April, um, once the appeal period on the budget melt had expired. Uh, we had a deadline of May 17th. We advertised it through the list of consultants that the um, State Division for Historic Preservation has for uh, architectural historians. Pretty extensive list. Uh, and we got three responses. And uh, we had a committee uh, that was made up of uh, Barb Farr and Skip Flanders and me. And um, so the one that we selected is uh, 106 Associates. This is uh, Scott Newman. Uh, Bill went through, uh, you know, I discussed it with Bill before uh, bringing a, um, a recommendation to you. Uh, the proposal is, uh, is very thorough. Uh, I think you'll recall Scott's work on the Waterbury Village Historic District survey or resurvey. This is a brand new area. Um, it's not a current historic district for Waterbury, so it would be uh, an additional district. We have five now, so this would be a sixth uh, district. So this work would take us through the submittal to the state. Um, it would include um, taking the comments from the state, incorporating them into the survey. Uh, it would, um, it's set up with a schedule to be done all this year under this current year budget uh, with work to be completed in mid-December. So uh, the cost is, um, is under budget. This proposal is $10,880. As I mentioned, we budgeted $12,000. Uh, it's a good, thorough uh, proposal. And what we would be looking for this evening would be authorization 
for us to enter into a contract with uh, 106 Associates, uh, Scott Newman, to, to do the work. And you liked it because it was thorough and under budget? Right. We <laughs> what gave, were your selling points? We, we, right. We gave uh, all the consultants the budget. Um, it, um, it's partly my philosophy of working with consultants. You're really looking at qualifications. It's not like bidding construction or something like that. And uh, so they all came in within budget. Um, we had two that were very good. Brian Knight was the other one. Um, and then we had somebody uh, actually local here who uh, proposed a survey. But this one, the committee felt, uh, rose well above the others as far as quality and uh, experience. So it was very, it is thorough, yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yep. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? And what we'll do is the similar process to the work on the Waterway Village or in the district. So um, it'll come back to you for a presentation, for your input. Uh, we'll be contacting all the landowners by letter because uh, the consultant has to go out and take photographs. They just take them from the street, typically. Uh, so we'll be doing a mailing to everybody uh, to inform them about this. Uh, we did have a case with the other district where somebody objected. Uh, their property was withheld from the uh, survey when it was submitted. Uh, in order to block the whole project moving forward, we have to have at least half of the residents uh, objecting. Uh, but uh, we did have a case uh, before one one objection, and uh, there might have been two. I think there I were know two. one was withheld. There were two, weren't there? I think there were two. Yeah. yeah. Well, this, um, when this survey is done, Will the entire village have been done? Well, not not the village that's up behind the Holiday Inn or the right. Best Western, but um, there's the Mill Village, right? Right. That's and then a district. there's the one that we did last year, which right. included Railroad Street and yeah. Union Street, part of Stowe Street, and then the initial, the Main Street one. Right. 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 So the, this, in addition to the other survey, will cover. Uh, Just pretty much all of the historic <coughs> part of Waterbury Village, right? Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> if just for some of the newer ones, if you're on the board, one of the reasons why the former trustees of the village wanted the last survey done, which the same company Scott Newman did, was that if you have this designation uh, and if there's a disaster, you you have you don't you don't have to meet as stringent uh, recovery standards as you would if you're not a historic uh, structure, right? That's correct. Yes. And these properties, since they are historic, it partly meant to give property owners the the best um, the broadest choices going forward if if there was another flood. Now this area in question did not flood at all during the. Irene, right? That's and correct. flooded around under the railroad bridge and through the intersection there, but no flood waters got down uh, into the Butler Street yeah, that's or right. North Main Street area. So right. it's a little bit of a high area there because certainly moving down Route 2, it flooded. So. Steve? Yeah. Would this be um, looking at doing any sort of restrictions to properties in that area or just really being an inventory? This is strictly an inventory. Um, there's been some discussion about extending design review to our, our uh, historic districts. Okay. So that's something the Planning Commission has um, had under discussion where there would be some level of review if someone wanted to, to demolish an historic structure or uh, modify it in some way. But this proposal, uh, this is completely separate from zoning. Uh, it just um, it could give um, a property owner access to historic tax credits right. for restoration of an income producing building. So that's um, one of the perks of, of having an historic mm -hmm. structure. In this process, Scott will do the inventory of the layout with a report and then does the proposal that the board is um, acting on tonight uh, 
go through the process of submitting it to the state and uh, right. the whole review process that the State Department of Historic Preservation will have to do? Yeah, that, that's correct. And, and this, um, this step is not authorizing the submittal of the survey. That will come, at a, as I recall, at a later date. Once you see the survey, once we get feedback from property owners, then there'll be another decision point that uh, the, you, the select board, will have about submitting it to the state, and then it would uh, go from there to the National Park Service. There's the State Register of Historic Places, or yeah, uh, which is sites and structures, and then there's the National Register. So the first step is the state has to go to the State Historic um, Commission, and then from there, once they authorize it, uh, it can be forwarded to the National Park Service. So, so this step is just authorizing the preparation of the survey. Right. And there's, there's no other neighborhood here. When we did the last one, um, I believe either the state or the national folks a actually asked the, the survey to be extended. We had to add right. some properties That's because right. they around the school wondered school why they weren't yeah. included. But there's no other properties really here that No, can. this is very clearly defined. We toured it with Scott. Uh, not, I'm sorry. I'm, Scott Dillon and um, the uh, historic um, historian, architectural historian oh. with the state. So um, Scott actually gave us a preliminary proposal for budget purposes, and, and we, uh, Devin Coleman is the uh, state architectural historian, and we toured it because we wanted to make sure that he was in support of us pursuing this survey, and, and it is very uh, well defined, and I don't. He didn't mention anything on that tour no, about possibly extending it, right? So, Steve, this is looking for state designation versus national 106 designation. Well, it, um, yeah, 106 is uh, uh, section 106 of the right. uh, Historic Preservation Act, right? So, this would be, uh, it would go to the state and then um, it could be forwarded to the National uh, Park Service. Typically, it these historic districts are forwarded, uh, especially if, um, for instance, with the historic tax credits, uh, there are federal credits. Right. So if uh, property owners, if we're interested in having property owners be able to access that, then uh, there's a benefit to going to the national level. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that it was clearly suggested here tonight. I mean, Bill touched a little bit on options for people in the district, but how does this, two questions, yep. will this add an additional um, a chapter or so in the municipal plan? What impact would it have on a municipal plan? And uh, as far as zoning regulations, um, homeowners, will there be additional paperwork for them as well, pro, con, uh, how will that impact the zoning world? Right. So, um, so this process all the way through to the even the national level, um, in of itself, um, has no local. We don't have anything in place right now that would um, cause a, a property owner to have to jump through some additional steps. If a project goes through Act 50 and this is um, in place, then it it would come into play. There, there are very few properties in this area that are either on, currently under Active 50 jurisdiction or could be. I think the only one is the new uh, townhouses and office out just past the Ezra Butler house. Um, so the, um, the, as far as the missile plan, we don't have to revise the missile plan as a result of this. Uh, we do have a chapter that deals with, uh, that includes historic resources. So in that sense, it's so next time around, it yeah, would we just would get added to that. We would add it yep. this to the municipal plan. Yep. Um, so so there's a separate, um, whole separate process for anything dealing with zoning that would come back to you. So um, you know there there is some interest on the part of uh, both DRB members and planning commission members, to be honest, to look at historic um, structures and have some level of review if one is being modified or proposed for demolition or uh, developed in some way. 
So I think that, um, I, I think, you know, we should be honest that there's concern in the community <coughs> and that uh, the Planning Commission may um, bring a proposal to you in that regard. But this in of itself would not have that, uh, any kind of effect like that. That's a separate decision, can be, uh, you can take it or leave it, you know, and that's your call ultimately. But uh, there, there's definitely interest in, uh, in looking at that down sure. the road. Yep. Yep. Okay. So would you like a motion to approve the um, hiring of 106 Associates? Is that what you're looking for? Yes, and authorizing Bill to sign a contract as well. Okay, I'd make a motion to move ahead with 106 <coughs> Associates and authorize Bill to sign a contract. <clears throat> for the inventory. Somebody like to second that motion? I'll second. Okay. Any wish for further discussion? Questions? Seeing none, all those who would like to approve it, say aye. 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 Okay. Great. Thank you. We'll Thank you. Keep you uh, Perfect, Steve. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. You don't have anything else for me, right, Bill? Okay. Good. Sorry. You're off Good. Thank you. <laughs> Have a good night. Okay, thanks. <clears throat> One more little issue, people, and I think we'll be out of here. <clears throat> I, uh, last meeting, I think we talked a little bit about whether or not to consider a, a public meeting to discuss the town road issues or the policy that we talked about perhaps putting in place. <clears throat> I just wanted to touch base on that a little bit more. And uh, ask the board, I guess, to as a group, to either vote on uh, verbally or uh, as to whether or not we would like to have some form of a formal public meeting to have input from our town members as to how they feel about how the roads are being maintained, the, the salt and sand uses, uh, many issues with storm erosion, any of those types of things, uh, mud issues, whatnot, paving issues, just an all around conversation about what to do, any ideas, some form of policy, of, you know, again, I keep beating the drum on looking at <coughs> maybe restricting or cutting back a little bit on our salt and sand uses. Um, how do people feel about it? I know Mark kind of wasn't, didn't think that a public meeting might be necessary, but <coughs> maybe you could speak a little bit as to why or why not. I mean, I don't think there's any harm. I'm not harm. trying to put anybody on the spot here, so. I don't think there's any harm in a public meeting. I just think maybe there's some work we could do ahead of time before we put because as soon as you put it in the public forum, it's really careful that those meetings take certain directions and there's no, it would need to be very orderly with, you know, I think goals that we put together and what we hope to achieve coming out of that meeting and the specific issues that we maybe see or the direction we're considering going and trying to get some public feedback on that. I think that's a much more productive meeting than leaving it a little too open-ended because a certain small select few could just, you know, basically control the meeting. So I think that's the risk you take, but I'm not saying that it's bad to consider doing this. Are you saying like have an agenda kind of tabled out as to- Yeah, and I think trying to limit too much discussion or, and just have something that we're, you know, try to have a whole list of things we're trying to get through in that meeting to make sure that, you know, for example, we could spend a significant amount of time just talking about the idea of foam and who knows, you know, so like we just have to be careful that, yeah, yeah. and you know, something, or it could be literally an hour of people complaining that their road is bad or my road's bad. I showed up, my road is bad. I don't know. You got to be, I don't know, you just gotta, we gotta think that through a little bit, but I'm, I'm not saying that a public meeting isn't good. I just think that we have discussed a lot about um, how and, and what we see is the direction we need to go with roads. I know we talked 
uh, about Bill doing a little bit more inventory work and just organizing that a little bit. I think making sure that that work is done and having as much of a discussion on the select board side of where we think we are before we go into that meeting will help so we don't look like you know we're on our heels a little bit. Yeah, the, um, the inventorying and talking about, you know, resurfacing, paving, um, even trying to upgrade to, you know, reduce uh, impacts of mud season, that's kind of one thing, and I agree wholeheartedly with what you're saying, that we should kind of maybe map out a strategy, this is what we're planning to do, and we think it will cost this to go down that route and does the public support it with the understanding that there's probably going to be some financial impact? I think the other uh, branch of this discussion is not so much a financial issue, even although it does have some financial impact, is the uh, discussion about altering winter maintenance, especially when it comes to sand and salt use. I, th I think that's a very different kind of <clears throat> ball game than yeah. the other one. That's more of a, we kind of, we don't have a bare roads policy right now, but we kind of uh, maintain our roads with the expectation from the traveling public that pretty much any time they want to drive out of their driveway and go anywhere they want, they can do it uh, without having to worry about snow tires and all the rest. So I, I just think that if we're going to do it, there are two distinct things. Winter maintenance, salt and sand use, you can tie the environmental issues into the salt and sand use. There is some financial implication if you don't put it out there. You don't have to spend as much to buy it. Right. Um, yeah. And then... Well, I think I'm, I'm personally I'm more interested in that animal than, than I am the actual maintenance part because I think... <coughs> You kind of got a handle on that to some degree, right? I yeah, mean, I think so. I mean, we're moving in the right direction. Yeah, right. Um, so. Uh, it seemed like we had talked to Bill about coming up with um, a list of maybe some paving projects that would be uh, that inventory work and what yeah, would be next. We're in the process so, of doing that. Yeah. But that's very different than the salt sandwich. But she can back in on. Yeah. So it seems to me, and that would be covered in a regular select board meeting, so. Yeah. I agree with both what Mark had to say as well as Bill. Uh, I do think that we're in pretty good shape with a plan for in infrastructure over a course of time. I think the issue of should we spend less money salting and, you know, looking at sanding. Long term. Yeah, looking at, but I think we really need maybe time outside of this meeting, you know, have, you know, kind of like a subcommittee time to really get our act together as to where we want, because that has to be a very, I think a very structured public meeting if we're gonna have it. Yep. Otherwise, it's just gonna be, wind up becoming a, fr a free for all where everyone's gonna have an opinion. Yeah, Yeah, I would hate to see it just be a gripe session. Yeah. So I don't disagree with anything that you guys have said. Um, so how do we go about, I mean, a committee is certainly a possibility. Um, mm -hmm. I guess we just got to think a little bit about maybe what, if, if we get some time at home or whatever, think about uh, maybe how this type of meeting would look, what it would look like and whether or not we put a committee together and uh, come up with a more structured agenda for, for a public meeting. Yeah, and yeah. we may want to, even in that committee, maybe include a few key local citizens. You know, it doesn't have to be just select board members. Right. I think having them structure, you know, what's going to be said in the meeting, I think will help, you know, create a better dialogue. Yeah. No, I think if we could just come, um, prepared each one of us with a, you know, a list of five things. You know, um, I know it's, it's, it's hard to generalize that much, but you know, if you're gonna put out a community input forum, 
You're going to have to, like Mark said, you're going to have to give them an agenda or else it just becomes a, a, a free-for-all. And uh, if we clearly can can have some consensus of mind of, of what the hot button issues are, then yep. we can present the agenda and, and be prepared to discuss it. I think, well, I think the other thing that I, I struggle with sometimes is I hate to think that we need to start from scratch and there seems to be, you know, we, we all travel around Vermont and there are certain towns you drive through and, and you know, maybe it is literally down to budget, but maybe it's not. Maybe they are figuring out different ways to build their roads and there doesn't seem to be and, and maybe I'm wrong but like a good resource to to find out what other towns are doing and and what where they're finding success um, so I don't know if that's something to just keep in mind as we all travel around Vermont is start to just take a look at what the condition of other towns roads are and then you know maybe start I mean I know Chris you've done that with Essex um, but just maybe doing a little more of that too, I think could go a long way so we don't feel like we're kind of starting from scratch a little bit. You know, we're part of the Regional Planning Commission, um, the Central Vermont Regional Planning Commission, and Steve is on the advisory committee for that. Uh, maybe, uh, and you know, they're one of, I think, nine Regional Planning Commissions, so maybe there's a forum there. Um, each Regional Planning Commission has a transportation planner that gets money through VTrans and they're there to be a service to the town, so maybe they could help us. Yeah, and I don't know if it's, you know, miles of road over Grand List to try to start to figure out, like, gauging how to figure out how to find comparable towns or if it's miles of road over population or what the right way to start to, to try to determine how we fit in the, in the grand scheme of Vermont and where, where to start to look for some of those answers. I don't know. Well, to Matt's point, I think maybe it's a task that we all should try to take on here before the next meeting is uh, jot down five, five things that uh, you'd like to see addressed. Um, I'm sure once everybody brings their list to the table, there will be some form of a consolidation. I'm sure it will overlap a little bit, perhaps, and uh, narrow it down a little bit, and we can talk about what the list is and how to move forward from there after that, if that's of anybody's interest. Sure. Yeah. Could this just be done at a regular select board meeting? The public meeting, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. But focusing on paving. Well, it's not paving. It's, no, it's, it's, the winter maintenance issue sure, is, winter well, it's policy. part of it. Environmental impacts. It's one issue. Yeah. You know, it's all kind of connected to some degree. I mean, uh, but I think my goal, I guess, is to have a policy, some form of a policy in place for the most part to address winter maintenance and, uh, and maybe some possible changes. I see the, uh, we get the mower going there for, for the uh, chervil. Um, my nephew just told me today he's going to actually think about putting out brochures to try to alert people of, it's becoming more obvious, I guess, to a lot of people that the trouble is an issue. It's taking, taking over? Taking over everything, absolutely, yeah. No matter where you look, it's there. Uh, so yeah, um, I think it, you just want to kind of concentrate on winter operations, uh, how it impacts, you know, our waterways, uh, even perhaps stormwater issues, you know, the, uh, like on the Shaw Mansion dip, for instance, uh, we've had a couple of good washouts there. All that material ends up in the Thatcher Brook and goes downstream, and I just took it upon myself to get a name from Carla, the neighbor halfway up the hill, and I called them and asked them if they'd be interested in allowing the town to possibly divert some water across their property to cut off a portion of that flow going down through the dip to reduce the, the washouts because uh, it costs the town a lot of money and the environmental impact is huge dumping that, that much uh, material into the brook every time 
we get one of those washouts. In fact, a couple of years ago, we had a pretty good storm that took out half that road by the big culvert. Um, I forget how many loads we put in there, but it was a lot of material. That all ends up downstream. And, uh, so it's those types of issues that I think over and above our infrastructure plan that we need to start to consider. So if people can put their thinking caps on for the next meeting, we'll maybe put something together. Okay, is there anything else? I would say I have some concerns about, um, I've taken some pictures actually last week as I've been helping with planting flowers for revitalizing waterberry, and I've seen some sidewalk cracks and um, uneven settling that caused me to trip. Um, one is on one side of Stowe Street, and I talked to Steve about it, and he told me that when the Main Street project, um, I, wasn't, I wasn't aware that only one, ha one sidewalk was gonna, one half of the street was gonna have a sidewalk replaced in the Main Street project down to Bidwell Lane. He told me that he thought in front of Stimson Graves was not gonna be replaced, but the, unfortunately. So I, I mean, how do we address that? Um, how do I, do I send those pictures to Bill and ask him if he can put that in his um, planning for sidewalk this year? Because I know we only have $10,000 a year for sidewalks. Well, we have $10,000 this year. You can, you can, as a select board member, advocate for adding okay. next budget time. Well, I'm advocating because it looks dangerous to me. <laughs> um, and then there's also, this is not a sidewalk, well, actually on Elm Street, there's some section that's bad too, one of those yeah, businesses that we're just looking There's at. quite a bit of sidewalks, but I mean. I just uh, don't want to see anybody get hurt. Um, so, so I'm advocating for that. So there you go. <laughs> Take my picture. Well, that's been an ongoing issue. What do I do with my photographs? And, uh, <laughs> <clears throat> it's funny because up in Stowe, I, I don't know if I mentioned at the last meeting, but a lot of Main Street and Stowe has been reconstructed, and you've probably seen it. Yeah. Said, Mark? Yeah, it's yeah. part of Stowe today. Well, so also all that in the, the right in the village, they've yeah. put foam underneath it all, but just down the road there by the car wash, I think it's part of the Cabricky. Yeah, they're getting a whole new sidewalk. They're not putting any foam underneath that. They're yeah. just doing the same thing that we did here back when the project was done, the original work was done here. So it's uh, it's amazing that uh, it's slowly catching on. Maybe but they're, uh, maybe, it's maybe like, it will be a good test case. Yeah. Well, <laughs> right. Well, the Kabuki project is being paid for by the state, sure. and the, yeah. the downtown <laughs> Stowe is being paid for by Stowe. So right. that's the difference. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, well, if there's nothing else on the list, then a motion to adjourn would be appropriate. I'll make a motion to go enjoy the weather and adjourn. Perfect. There's a second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, of this, get out of here if they aye. 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 It's like a lawsuit with my hand. Oh my God, you're right, Carl. Right on time.